sister, uh, that sister Hafsa, uh, I don't know. I hope if anybody knows her to actually get me in contact with her, I truly miss her. So she was actually one of the people that really had an impact in my life. Um, she was from India originally and got married to a guy from Holland and she uh, was really active and the way she became Muslim she was sleeping in India she was visiting she was married to this guy from Holland who was active because of Palestine so she basically falls in love with him gets married to him and one day she went to visit her family in India but it uh, she was asleep and then all of a sudden she hears the Aden and it just woke her up from her sleep she wakes up and just feels that she has to go to the masjid and sure thing she goes to the masjid didn't know really what to do but she saw the people um, making wadu so she started doing exactly like them makes the wadu and just gets into uh, that you know the the relationship and the start of the relationship with Islam um, of course, her husband refused to become Muslim, uh, but she was putting that influence on her children to become Muslim. Um, her children, uh, in, at least they became Muslim. Her son refused um, to, uh, her son, re well, her husband refused to become Muslim. Her son uh, basically was, I guess, influenced by his mother. And even when it came to, I guess, um, circumcising the son, uh, the, the husband was completely uh, against it. So she was trying to convince her son and was getting into, I guess, that, uh, that influence that the mother uh, would have on her child in his Islam. And the, the father was scaring him, hey, they're gonna cut you up, they're gonna do this to you. And of course, mom convinced him that it was going to make him urinate better. <laughs> so, um, and sure thing, I mean, she had her impact on him, I don't know. And I don't, I don't know why I got into this, but I guess Sister Hafsa is, is somebody that is Allah yirhamha if she is dead. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her a long life if she is alive. And um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her. I can never forget her. Um, because she was a person that was always getting the vibe into connecting us with Ramadan, connecting us with, um, with dhikr. And she was Sufi. Um, she was part of the Naqshabandi Tariqa. And... Um, I think what, that's one thing. She even lived at our house uh, for almost a couple months, uh, maybe maybe three, four months or something like that. Uh, and subhanAllah, I mean, there's something that I know many people would be agitated with what I'm going to say, but I think it's fair enough to say because Allah subhanAllah says, uh, Don't let your animosity or your friction between any group of people prevent you from being just, just and being just is closer to taqwa. I think that's one thing about, uh, about Sufis is, uh, of course, excluding the many bid'ahs that are out there. But I think the beautiful thing in where it's always trying to find the inspiration in the kid, trying to find the inspiration in connection uh, in connection with the Muslim community. And I really think that they do the best in, uh, in bringing in tarbiya, bringing in tarbiya and bringing in that that Islamic discipline within uh, the community. And of course, even Adab Talab al Ilm, they would have uh, the Shaykh even uh, with the Murid. Uh, sometimes, yes, it's exaggerated, but I think that piece of it, in where you're going beyond the Ilm and you're trying to adopt it as a discipline and as a practice, I think the other uh, Islamic organizations really need to learn how to do that. And that's why, if you actually look at <clears throat> if you look at uh, the, I guess, the influence it has on the followers and even let's call it the different influences that were coming from the outside and what we're talking about, for example, atheism. Um, atheism 
uh, went deep in most Islamic organizations. And I, what I would mean by went deep, at least in the followers. Um, in the followers, you had a lot of influence. Many followers did. Uh, I don't maybe the word many is maybe not an accurate word, but we had a number of followers from different, uh, from different Islam groups. We had Salafis that were influenced by atheism and really left Islam. We had from the Ikhwan as well. We had um, from, you know, just various groups, but we probably had the least uh, of the Sufis actually get influenced with uh, with with atheism and the impact of atheism, I think that spiritual and emotional relationship with the dean is extremely important, and I think is missing within our community. Um, many times we're just focused just on the ilm, and then that emotional relationship we tend to think of it as too uh, too uh, maybe utopian we tend to think of it as it's too much of a fantasy but i think it's if you look at the hadith that emotional relationship was always present as well so to think of it as sufi is definitely not accurate and i think we have to revive the emotional relationship between one the ummah and the Ummah and the rest of the individuals within the Ummah, with the, with the rest of the Muslims. And number two, the Ummah or the Muslims and also the different actions that we would engage in, which is why in Imam al-Ghazali, who died 505 Hijriya, he actually wrote his book, Ihya al the revival of the Islamic sciences, the revival of the religious sciences. It was really because people were taking uh, the Islamic sciences as really nothing but rigid information, and that was impacting the relationship between them and Islam, between them and um, their spirituality as well. So wanted, if you look at that book, the book is translated. Um, if you look at that book, he does a really good job in taking you into um, under knowing and understanding how the adab for a different type of adab are done. Um, and same thing, if if I were to connect and probably add that book, which is Ihya Ulum al for Al-Ghazali, plus the book Zad al-Ma'ad, uh, it, it is translated, or let me say, summarized and translated. Zad al-Ma'ad, maybe I can... I'll see if I can actually help you see that. I think that book was probably my one of my favorite books, Zed al Ma'ad. Um, let me see if I can actually, yeah, there we go. And that book, what I like about it, so here it is, the provisions for the hereafter. And you could see that it's actually available in PDF as well. So hey. Um, so Zed al Ma'ad. One thing I like about it, um, I used to live with that book, literally live with that book. Um, he basically takes you into basically the different chapters of the Prophet's life in Sira, but that's not just it. He always would. Oh, I love that book. Yeah, that that book is amazing. So that book, he actually wrote it while he was traveling. So. Whenever it was nighttime, it was basically the moonlight would be his light, and he would write that at the under moonlight. <clears throat> so that's why he called it Zad al Ma'ad. Zad al Ma'ad actually means uh, the provision and the shelter that you would carry with you when you're traveling. So it was just under the moonlight, and he would just write a uh, write his commentary on Sira. And there's one piece, like in Arabi, he would say, so he would, like the guidance for the Prophet in uh, the different actions. Um, and he would go in details in how we were, we're supposed to get the inspiration in terms of Hajj or in terms of the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we dress, the way um, each and every, so he will take a hadith and he'll list all these hadith, he'll list all these inspirations, he'll list all these guidance, he'll list all these adab in how we should live our Islam. And I think this is important and this is really missing out because sometimes we become like 
like a robots trying to put in our Islam anywhere we're really missing out on the inspirations. Like what do I, what guidance do I get from that? What inspiration do I get from that? Why am I doing it this way? And it's not just a, some kind of just do it because I'm just telling you to just do it. It's an issue of really seeing that. And of course, um, th this book, you could see it's it's available. I, I just hit right there, Zed and Mad in English, and it gave me all these books where you could actually find it. There we go, Zed and Mad in English, and yeah, you can you can actually find that. Now, but let's look at the other book, right? Let's see um, the other book, and we said, yeah, right? Let's see, yeah, I'm gonna write it down. Okay, it doesn't want to, yeah, Let's see, oh wow, popped up right away. Here we go. So you could even revival of religious science. It didn't give me what the book looks like, but you could see that this book is actually available in English. The translation from what I remember um, was actually, oh, look, it's right there. Um, yeah, I like this internet archive because they actually give you all the books. Here we go. You could see it's actually in nine volumes and you have it right at the tips of your fingers. Maybe I can give you all that and somebody you know might actually be so against it and they'll say hey this book contains a lot of hadith ba'ifa and so forth and i'll say well you do have an iraqi that actually went over the book and reviewed the hadith and went into details in explaining which hadith are authentic and which hadith are not so oh this is okay so this is the actual arabi one i guess but you will find the english one this is the actual arabi one but yeah this is the actual arabi one but still it's it's available in english i know that for sure so here we go you could you could see it i don't want to go you you know what, what, what let's actually click it so here we go what is it it's can you here. tell us a little bit about um imam ghazali Okay, so Imam Al Ghazali, fair enough. Imam Al Ghazali lived as an orphan. His both his parents died. Imam Al Ghazali, um, he was living in Baghdad, and in order to get shelter and to be in an orphanage, he had no choice but to him and his brother, uh, but to go for it was called the Madrasa Nizamiya, the Nizamiya school. That's the basically like a boarding school. So you would have to be a student at Nadamiya school in order to get one, to get the food and to get the privilege for having a place to stay in. So Il Ghazali was part of the school, but he said, <laughs> We seek the ilm for not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They really went in that school not because they wanted to get an education, but really because they wanted food and shelter. And he said, But ilm refuses but to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um later Il Ghazali uh later Il Ghazali becomes not you know, just that the, a student, at least in the school, but later he goes farther than everyone else. And later he becomes the main teacher in the school. So first he was a student, then he becomes one of the best students, and then he becomes the teacher, and then he becomes the head of the school. He becomes the main principal, the main president for the school. It wasn't a school like what you mean by a school, it was more like a university than a school. Um, but later, El Ghazali goes into um, a, a moment of depression or anxiety. So he leaves the school completely leaves everything, leaves even Baghdad, and goes to Al-Quds. He basically just abandons everything, literally abandons his country, abandons everyone, and just goes to, um, to Al-Quds. And in Al-Quds, that's where for four years, he stays in Al-Quds, um, or in Palestine, of course, um, and writes some of his books. And uh, the books that, of course, it's worthy of mention uh, that uh, that uh, during the time that he was in Baghdad, I think the circumstances were completely different. Uh, the circumstances in Baghdad were 
it was a debate in philosophy, and which is where he wrote the book, Tehafut uh, al Everybody is debating who's right and wrong, and everybody is debating about epistemology and all these different things about philosophy. And he himself actually went in it. But then there's this uh, question in where, well, how do you actually make a sense? And where does knowledge really begin from? Do we begin it from having sense? What does having sense really mean? What does common sense mean? What does a fact mean? And where does it come from? All of those questions, they basically left him in where he went into that moment of depression. That's why he left everything and went to Al-Quds. In four years in his stay in Al-Quds, um, he basically wrote a book. It's called Al-Munqidh Min Al-Dalal. Al-Munqidh Min Al-Dalal, I think the most important, we had to read the whole book during our epistemology class. Um, he was the main figure, of course, in our epistemology class because Dr. Mustafa Abu Sway is actually specialized in Al-Ghazali. And he is specialized in the epistemology for Al Ghazali. So, Dr. Mustafa Abuswai, he even got his PhD from Boston University and wrote his PhD dissertation on Al Ghazali. Okay, maybe I can show you Mustafa Abuswai himself. Okay, this is my professor, so I think it would be fair enough that, and he speaks very good English. So, yeah, because his specialty is actually, um, is actually um, English, anyways. So, that's his specialty. This is my professor. Mustafa Abu Swahid, and I think it's fair. Mashallah, a very smart and a very intelligent professor. He speaks six languages, Mashallah, and of course, fluent English, uh, great in Arabic, and Mashallah, this is this is him. And anyhow, um, so uh, Al Ghazali then goes. He was the one that made us actually. He was my philosophy professor, epistemology, and also, and also, I guess the part about. Uh, the, what really attracted me as well, along with Sister Hafsa, him to Sufism. Anyhow, so Al Ghazali, right there, uh, basically in his book Al Mulqad Min Al Dalal, uh, said a very important statement. So he goes into into the different uh, the different details about what really is going on in his mind with all these questions popping up and it was really trying to get to what makes a fact what makes the foundation of you know how you would have uh, that the philosopher said I am I I think therefore I am so that's that's really uh, that, that's really I would say uh, inspired by Ghazali in some way but anyhow so Il Ghazali said the most important statement in his book in where he said that it was really Nurul Qadafahullah fi qalbi. That's it. How did I get to finding the basis of facts, the basis of truth, the basis of what acts as the foundation for knowledge? or epistemology, he said it was really nurun qadhafahullah fi qalbi. It was really just some light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in my heart. And in other words, um, to summarize it, it's exactly like you would look at that ayah in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, iyyat tabi'una illa dhan, summarize the whole epistemology and said, well, they would follow uh, dhan, they would follow all the speculation. Or even and for certain feelings, certain sensibilities, certain emotions, sensations, etc., or desires and pleasures. And and that is that they and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent them from him guidance that is the light. And that's what Al Ghazali had actually reached it, which is really it's just a light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can try and get into a lot of philosophies and a lot of arguments, a lot of debates, but there's one thing is that the start really is Nurun Qadavallahu Fi So that's how to get to Yaqeen. Um, to get to Yaqeen, yes, you do certain practices, but 
at the end of the day is that it's really guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will just give you that moment of yaqeen, that moment of raha, that moment of rest, that moment of, um, I guess, tranquility in your heart where you adopt the faith, adopt the faith, not blindly, certainly, you've got the arguments for it, but there's that moment where it's like, how do I get to that moment of yaqeen? I just want to feel that I had reached the level of yaqeen where it's not, yaqeen here is not to be against doubt. So it's not to mean the 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 uh, the antonym of doubt, but yaqeen here is a moment where you're just completely at a total a total relaxation, a total um, commitment in your faith. So this is not talking about doubt. This is not uh, you know an, an antonym to doubt to mean um, trying to get to. Uh, that point in where, yes, I want to make sure that I'm really not falling in doubt about the religion, but it's a moment where it's like, I want to be at peace with myself, inner peace with myself, inner peace with, uh, with the way I would adopt the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I would adopt, adopt the, the, the practices of Islam and I'm feeling that tranquility. So that's the part that I guess, um, Il Ghazali was trying to get to. He clearly, if you were to read his book, Al Munqad bin al Dalal, he clearly was not going into doubt in the faith. It wasn't a doubt into faith because that's why he was actually praying. That's why. Um, he was continuing to be in Bayt al-Maqdis. He was continuing to um, make his siyam, make his qiyam, do all of that. It was trying to get to a certain level of yaqeen, a certain level of spirituality. All right. So this is not to mean that a person that he was going into some doubt about the faith. He wasn't doubting uh, the faith. So just wanted to make sure that everyone understands that one. So that that's a little bit. Il Ghazali died 505 Hijriya. Later he goes back um, to Al Iraq. So uh, just a little bit. Al Iraq uh, throughout history was a place of, I would say, debate, a place of uh, maybe uh, turbulences. Let's call it that way. It was not an easy place where there's lots of arguments, a lot of intelligent and smart people, but um, sometimes it's, you know, in search of a calm place, a place of tranquility. So yes, and definitely Iraq was not there. So he went to Al-Quds to find that. Um, there you go. Maybe, yeah, there is something that I must admit. In Al-Quds, in Palestine, inshallah, you would all have the chance to go there. There is a certain sense that you will not find anywhere else but in al -Quds. I promise you, just when you enter the doors for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, there's a I don't want to say a breeze to make it like it's some kind of a wind or some kind of a temperature, but there is some feeling of peace that you will not find anywhere else. And I think that was one main thing that attracted uh, Cat Stevens, who later became Yusuf Islam, in where he sensed it. And I think anybody that goes to Al-Quds and enters in Masjid Al-Aqsa, you will not help but feel it. You will recognize it. There is a sense of peace. There is a sense of tranquility that is not found anywhere else. Despite all the political, despite all the political, uh, uh, you know, uh, fighting and all the fears there and all of that, but it is something that you will sense. It is something Inshallah, you know, maybe book a ticket right now and actually go and, and feel it and tell me, tell me if you feel it, let's say it that way. And that's one thing I really miss. I really, really miss in the Masjid Al-Aqsa. It's that this sense of peace, the sense of tranquility. I mean, remember, the Prophet said to go to the heavens, to go to the skies. He didn't go from Mecca directly up. No, he had to go from Mecca all the way to Al-Quds in order to go up and ascend to the heavens. It's like the door, the main entrance, the doorway to heavens is actually right above the Masjid Al-Aqsa. 
picture that. Yeah, that sounds really scary. And that sounds really peaceful. And the Prophet Sallam joined with all the prophets in Al Masjid Al Aqsa. And of course, it's not Al Masjid Al Aqsa to mean this actual monument that you have right now, right? But Al Masjid Al Aqsa is really the place. And yes, I guess right now, taking the piece to actually remember Al Masjid Al Aqsa, right? All right, let's continue right there, inshallah. Yes, and, and I think, yeah, it is it is beautiful. And I think one of the main things that I miss in Al Masjid Al Aqsa, all right, is really this event. I want you to hear it. And then um, Al Aqsa, maybe I could do it like that. And let me say, okay, Nick. It was actually my, um, it was actually. See, this is my favorite edition. Hey, hyaluron serum with so, microepidemic. This wasn't supposed to be part of it, but we'll let it pass. And yeah, but we'll, I'll let you see it, inshallah. HA to deeply penetrate yeah. and replump in one hour. So yeah, this is what we get in Malaysia, basically these, now you see it. This is my favorite edition. <clears throat> This is unbeatable, to be honest, unbeatable. And of course, for Masjid Al-Aqsa and Al-Adan and the relationship between, I would say, Al-Ghazali and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, I think I can get the vibe why he chose Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And
I think why he chose Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Um, I can see the relationship, uh, the peace that you would find in Al Masjid Al Aqsa, uh, the uh, the yaqeen that you would find in Al Masjid Al Aqsa is definitely um, where you would really get that vibe and that inspiration and subhanallah it's it's beautiful all right so we're going to continue right here inshallah with our back to tafsir exactly Nura. Um, back to our tafsir um right there um so may uh, we left yesterday off with this ayat afala yatadabbaruna alquran walaw kana min indi ghayri llahi lawajadu fihi ikhtilafan kathira an wa idha ja'ahum amrun min al-amn aw al-khawf adha'u bih we went in details about the munafiqin and we went in details in regards to the uh, the different behaviors and of course what led them to such a behavior what led them to such a behavior and of course we talked about uh, some of the things in um, how to remove such uh, an influence of nifaq and we talked about salah we talked about zakah and of course it's really important to mention that when you look at the different ayat in where when it talks about the munafiqin for example it talks about munafiqin when they would go for prayer when they would go to prayer they would go with uh, uh, with complete laziness they would and even the Prophet had actually mentioned uh, that the heaviest salawat in other words the 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 hardest salawat on the munafiqin are really salat al isha and salat al fajr basically because they're during their night and they don't really have this inner uh, this inner motivation um, to go for salah, which basically is why they would find it harder on them to go for salah. And of course, certainly we talked about zakah, where because they want a dunya, so they don't want to give up for the sake of the principle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why it becomes harder on them. And of course, al-qital, putting in the effort, making the change, all of that. And of course, the main reason as well is really because they're circled and centered around the beauty or at least the entertainment of dunya. And it's certainly not the purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created them for, which is al-akhirah. And it's worth mentioning here that the ayat would always bring us this relationship between between our our own our own iman and of course how we want to be cautioned and be careful of adopting the behavior of al munafiqin so in order to do that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us into afalat al baruna al quran um, basically taking a moment to look closely and learn the quran learn islam learn the words of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and certainly it's in order to remove all the different influences that one might find as a result of probably the uh the maybe the abundance of kufr that surrounds you or maybe the abundance of people that are engaged in dunya so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was taking us into um not falling into the fear and not being not being consumers, of course, of their fear or even of their words, and to actually take it, the word, the words of the Prophet and taking all the that part in where you're you're relating, you're relating your own perspective, you're relating your own, uh, your own behavior, you're relating your own self as a part of the ummah, as part of the Muslim ummah, as part of. As part of the, of course, the salihin, that's basically what you would want to take as your role model. And of course, even that moment when you're trying to bring about the change, you're going to find a lot that are mocking you, a lot that are basically going to try to steer you away from your focus. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically takes you here. La tukallafu illa nafsak. The end of the day, you can only order yourself. Even if everybody turns away, harrad al you would only order yourself and harrad al motivate the believers. And at the end of the day, you may not have the data basically coming to you that you are heading towards victory, but 
Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that controls all the odds of everything. So, wallahu ashaddu ba'sa wa ashaddu tankila, even if the numbers don't necessarily, let's say, reveal or show that you are heading towards victory or heading towards making a change, you recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one um, is the one that basically makes the change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that determines the change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that determines oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that determines the change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that we turn to and therefore it's not basically the data that motivates or probably uh, takes away the motivation, we recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that motivates us. All right, let's continue. So that was just a summary of what we did last uh, yesterday. May yashfa shafa'atan hasanatan yakul lahu nasibun minha. Of course, because the ayah was before that talking about harad al mu'mineen to motivate the mu'mineen, to, to motivate the other believers into the practice of jihad or motivate the believers into what brings the change within the society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, May yashfa shafa'atan hasanatan yakul lahu nasibun minha. Whoever would basically either be an intercessor or a mediator in for a good cause, then they would get that reward for it. And who would ever be an intercessor or a mediator for an evil cause, or for a wrong cause, they would also be held accountable for it. And they would also get a share of that sin. And the Lord Almighty is basically the one that gives all the provision. In other words, don't necessarily run for any kind of a privilege in where you think that by being that mediator, by being that person to be at the forefront, that you would basically get a privilege. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that brings the provisions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that determines the ends of things. He's the one that is in control of all the, the different things. So all you need to do is bring in a good contribution. That's what basically means. Um, bring in a good contribution, even if it does not necessarily bring in the expectations that you had worked towards, even if it doesn't. get to the result that you worked hard for at the end of the day just by bringing in the contribution putting in the effort to bring about the best result basically you're going to be inshallah rewarded for it now to go to the second ayah which really is today's cause and what this means if you were to basically get a greeting then bring about a greeting in response with something that is better or respond at least with the same type of greeting. <inaudible> For the Lord Almighty would basically be in, con in basically um, um, uh, considering every single good deed that you would be doing. So the word hasiba <inaudible> is basically an account an accountant. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically being the accountant to account and put into account every single good deed that you might do. So I thought it would be good to basically take you to a page to go in details in regards to the greetings and how we would basically consider in Islam the different greetings. So let's see. Ya ayuhalladina amanu ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says right there. Oh, is this the page that I wanted to do? Uh, I don't know if this is the page that I wanted to do, but anyhow. Um, when you look at uh, uh, the ayat, is always basically taking us to always embrace one Islam and basically have that iman and simply to basically have taqwa at all times. 
So how would we actually get that? So remember, you could see that in the Quran, there were a number of different ayat that greeted in the word salam. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, salamun ala nuhin fil alameen. And peace be upon Nuh. Peace be upon Ibrahim. Salamun ala Musa wa Harun. Peace be upon Musa, Prophet Musa and Harun. Salamun ala Ilyasin, the family of Yasin. Uh, Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasbun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. So here it is again. Salam on all the different uh, messengers and the different prophets. And of course, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, the Prophet ﷺ was basically teaching us how to adopt the greetings, the way that people would greet in Jannah, and the way that the Malaika were even greeting, and the way Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was even greeting the Prophet himself. And of course, when you would look at the different ayat, idhalu alayhi faqalu salama. You would say, "Hal ataq hadith Allah fi Ibrahim al mukramin Do you see when Ibrahim? had basically got the, the, the guests come over. And who were they? They were mukramin. They were angels and the appearance of human beings. They entered and they said, Salama. But he basically said, Salam, munkarun. Salam, but I don't really know who you are. But then despite all of that, he basically went to his wife, went to his family, and basically slaughtered a sheep and prepared it to, in order to be hospitable. And of course, when he got that sheep closer to them, that basically barbecued sheep, they didn't eat anything. Well, that was because they were malaika. He got fearful because who would not eat? What? what who are you people? And that's when they basically um, uh, they basically told him who they really were. So the Prophet Sallallahu let's see this hadith, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, Amr ibn al-As, we know the famous Sahabi, and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As is basically his son. He basically said, سأل رجل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم and, I, and he said, Islam khair? A man came to the Prophet and said, what's the best Islam? And like, how is the best way to present myself? So the Prophet said, you would basically feed food. You give people, you donate food, etc. And of course, the best donation is basically the donation in where you would share a meal. And you would basically pass the greetings on those that you know and those that you don't know. Let's look at this hadith. You could see it's in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim hadith in number this and Sahih Muslim hadith number this. And of course, that would actually mean that the Prophet ﷺ was teaching us that the best Islam in where it's involving some form of a contribution, some form of an involvement, some form of creating a relationship in where you're feeding people, you're greeting people, you're bringing in <clears throat> a relationship between you and the people that surround you. In other words, you don't make that salam only to the people <clears throat> that you know, but you would basically pass the salam to the people that you know and the people that you don't know. Why? Because you're expanding your circle of acquaintances. You're expanding your circle of bringing peace. What does assalamu alaikum really mean? So assalamu alaikum means may peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. But the word alaikum is rather interesting because the word alaikum is in plural and not singular. And that's where the scholars explained that alaykum is really, even when there's only one person in front of you, but you would say it in a plural form because you're also including the malaika that are with this person. So you're basically sending the peace not only to the individual that is in front of you, but even to the malaika that are accompanying this person. Let's see. So when you're looking at... Um, uh, you're looking at a taslim. A taslim wasn't just something that they would just do as a religious thing, but it was a part of this engagement. Let's look at this one. This one is really rather interesting. Tufail ibn Ubay ibn Ka'b. He said, I used to come to Abdullah ibn Umar and we would just early morning and we would just go to the market. 
So basically to do what? And he said, well, we would go to the market and every single time Ibn Umar, he would basically come and come across people that are basically basically selling, you know, the stuff that would be considered the thrifty stuff, you know, just any anything. But he would basically just go there and just meet everyone. So whether the people that are selling the thrifty stuff or the expensive stuff, the name brand stuff, he would just go to the market just to basically go. And what would he do? He would just go. Let's say, Qal at I came to Ibn Umar and he said, follow me to the market. And basically he goes with him. And I said, what are you going to do in the market when you're not even standing to buy anything? And you're not even asking about the prices. You're not asking about, about the products and you're not even sitting in the market to do anything. So he basically um, said, why don't we just sit here? But Ibn Umar said, no, we just go to the market just to say, assalamu alaikum. We basically go there just to greet people. We're not go going there, not to look for prices, not to look for the best deal, and not to basically buy stuff, but we're just going there for a different kind of dhikr. What is it? We're just going there for another type of an extroverted dhikr. We're just going there to meet people pass on salams and just spread the peace and salams to the rest of everyone, every person that we see, people that we know, people that we don't know, just to say salamu alaikum. That's why he was going to the market. And it's really interesting because when you look at that in a society where I think we've become so uh, so convinced that, that we're introverted and that we should be to ourselves and all of that. What we had really created is loneliness within our society. What we had really created is a society where it feels that it's not belonging. It feels that it's living each and every single individual is living like in an enclave, living in some form of a ghetto, and we're not even getting to know people, sharing a smile, sharing a salam, sharing and just going there just to let people even, even if you're going, uh, let's call it shopping, but or going to the market. It's not that you're going to the market to buy stuff, but it's really to find people, to talk to people, to greet people, to tell them probably about Islam, to probably say salamu alaikum, just to really do that as a day, a day where, hey, I feel like right now going out just to greet people. So how do we actually do that at Tasli? So the Prophet and of course the Adab, the, the adab, what, what does adab mean? Adab means a number of different things. Number one, adab can be uh, the, the way that you would engage in a certain behavior. Okay, that's an adab. Adab can also mean a certain discipline. So it's an inner discipline and it's an outer behavior. So inner discipline and outer behavior, you're basically connecting yourself with a certain structure. So adab could also mean structure, could also mean etiquette, could also mean discipline, okay? And the sunnah is basically to start your salam before even starting any conversation, okay? Before you would even start talking about how you're doing, etc. you would basically start- Can I ask a question, sorry? Salam. Go ahead, Mandy. Okay, so um, so adab um, is that something that is learned? Because you said the akhlaq is something that maybe Allah Subhanahu wa Taala had given somebody, but the adab sorry. is two kinds. There is some adab, some adab. Remember hadith al uh, uh, ibn al Ashaj ibn Qais, where al Mundir the Prophet Sallam tells him that you have two traits that Allah and His Messenger love. And he said, uh, and he asked what what they were, and he said, al-hilmu forbearance and gentleness. And um, basically asked, the, and then of course, uh, al mundir asked whether that was something that he had disciplined himself in, or whether that was something that was created in him. And that's one thing, is that the Prophet ﷺ tells him, bal jabalak Allahu alayhima, 
In fact, they were created in you. So there are certain akhlaq, there are certain mannerisms that are created in you. A certain person that's just funny in just, they're just nature. Whether they're Muslim or not Muslim, they just happen to be a funny funny people, funny in nature. Other people, um, regardless of what their religion is, they're basically people that are easygoing. You know, they're always trying to find solutions for problems, regardless of their religion. It's basically an inner akhlaq. There are certain akhlaq that are jibiliya and certain akhlaq. Let me write that down. Muktasaba. What does that mean? Let me write that down so we can see it. Certain akhlaq are jibiliya. Jibiliya means it was created in you. It's part of your DNA. All right. And of course, certain things that are created in you are different than what was created in me and different than what was created in someone else. We're talking about things in where you basically have something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put in you. And that's jibiliya. There are certain things that are created in you. There are other akhlaq that are muktasaba. Muktasaba to mean acquired. You yourself would teach yourself how to basically adopt a certain uh, mannerism. You're not a funny person, but you decide, I would like to become a funny person. Not a fool and certainly not a clown, but I noticed that how people do it and how people manage to make that become a skill because it brings happiness and delight to people. So I'll basically learn the technique and how to do it. And that's the same thing. There are certain akhlaq that are muktasaba. Same thing with an adab. Some adab, some al -al adab are basically falling within al muktasab. Al adab are usually within al muktasab because they are within the structure. They are structured, they're, they're acquired, they're basically things that you discipline yourself into, or at least someone disciplines, uh, disciplines you into. So that's why it's important to learn these adab because you would not be capable of knowing them just by your instinct. Uh, yeah, sometimes you can know a certain adab by your instinct. We would know that for example, uh, putting injustice by our instinct. And we would know that there are even studies where even animals recognize what justice is. They would recognize, you would give a monkey, for example, a treat for being good, and the other monkey would basically be angry that, hey, wh why did you give them uh, a treat and you didn't give me a treat? So we would see that animals would recognize that there's a sense of justice. They would recognize certain adab. They would recognize certain things. You would have a cat, even when it wants to use the bathroom, it would basically make a dig a hole in the ground in order to basically hide its own its own droppings. And there you go. Where did they learn that adab? So certain adab arguably, even in animals, certain adab arguably, and as somebody that lived on a ranch, we saw that some animals do actually have, I mean, we at one point, I think we had six donkeys. If I'm, yeah, I think we had almost six donkeys. There were certain donkeys, this is real, certain donkeys that would be shy other donkeys, this is this is real. I'm not, I'm not making this up. Other donkeys, they're just mean. They are just mean. They see children and they will just find a way to harm them. Probably push them against the wall. Maybe step on them. Maybe um, do anything just to harm. They're just mean. Other ones, they're just extremely nice. Where other donkeys you know they'll they'll be there they recognize that this is a young child and they'll be easy on them they won't run they won't make them fall and you could say that hey if donkeys can recognize adab and can recognize different mannerisms if people can't recognize them then they're basically they're worse than <clears throat> Al-An'am cattle. And of course, donkeys are not from Al-An'am, but um, they're basically from at least 
uh, from the animals in general, all right? So we, we could see that. So animals themselves could actually recognize certain mannerisms. Um, so there are certain adept that are muktasab. I hope I answered that one, Nora. But that's a good question. Yes, yes, exactly. <clears throat> but of course, um, the mannerisms that are jubilee, uh, let's say it's your basically, I guess it's part of your uh, your attitude. You've got an attitude, and this attitude where um, every single time you find something unexpected happen, you basically get an attitude and you just turn away. Can I change this attitude of mine? You can. Or how do you prove that you can? Well, remember that in adab itself, once you recognize it, there are certain disciplines that you can change from having something within your basically muktasab, within your jibil, uh, your jibilla, into, in other words, your instinct, into disciplining that and making it something even smaller, making it something probably go away from your behavior. So even if it was something that was created in you, because, hey, don't we see, even when it comes to major sins, it's part of us. There are certain pleasures that we know they're part of us. They're part of our instinct. Reproduction is part of our instinct. The, but of course, there are some that will choose to feed that instinct and make it basically not disciplined to probably one person to probably going more and not recognize a limit. So there is an instinct. It's part of our animal slash human nature. It's part of our instinct. But some will choose to put a structure to it and live the principle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and others will let it loose. And the more loose you let your own pleasure or your own basically Jibilla uh, take you, the stronger it basically becomes, and the more it would overcome your own adab. And that's why when you look at all the rulings in Islam, all the rulings in Islam are really centered around adab, are centered around akhlaq. Even the Prophet actually said, I had to, I was sent in order to complete the pieces of the most beautiful things in mannerisms. And when you look at all the different rulings of Islam, they're basically related to akhlaq. They're basically related to mannerisms, principle. And when you look at all the different structure, it's really to put in even those things that might be jibiliya, even those things that might actually be part of your own nature, that it can be tamed. It can be structured. It can be disciplined. Yes, indeed, it might take one person more effort than another person, but it can be done. But you have to put in the effort. So it's not that, oh, I was born that way, that way, that way. It's just me. And, uh, and then I think right now with, uh, the, you know, the modern therapists and psychology and all of that, I think many times they're really feeding in many times of what you were basically wanting to feel comfortable with. And it's all about getting comfort. And, and unfortunately, um, it's not living the structure of adab and trying to put an effort for a person to change, but it's always about letting you live basically what you're comfortable with and not the structure. Why? Because of, of course, there's the, let's call it the postmodern and of course the atheist influence in it, where it's all about seeing that akhlaq is nothing but relativism. It's all relative. Since it's all relative, don't put a certain structure of adab. Don't put a certain structure of any type of a, a manner in what it should look like. Because to them, that would actually mean that it's bringing in more and more structure 
to bringing in more and more rigidness, to bring in more and more expectations, and that is going to lead to more and more of a burden and feeling guilt. So they're trying to take away the guilt feeling by taking away the whole idea that there is anything that we would have to abide by in terms of mannerisms, taking away the whole idea of guilt by considering that there is no structure, there is no certain uh, mannerism that we would have to turn to. So therefore, don't feel guilt, because they regard it with an atheist, of course, foundation, that uh, feeling guilty is basically something that we would have to make sure that we would take away from the society in order, of course, to let the person, according to them, live at peace. It's basically we take away the guilt feeling because it's a painful feeling. So that way, once we take it out, then they're feeling happy. But in Islam, no, the guilt feeling is really, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one instinct that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put within you in order to help you recognize that there is a principle, there is discipline, there's a structure, that there is a sense of stability that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created even within nature. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman, Allam al-Quran. If you look at that ayah, it, it's really interesting. Ar-Rahman, Allam al-Quran. Meaning the foundation of knowledge is basically in the Quran, taught the Quran. Ar-Rahman is the most merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allam al-Quran. Khalaq al-Insan. Created the human beings. Khalaq al-Insan. Allam al-Bayan. And taught you al-Bayan, the, the ability to communicate, the ability to speak, the speech, basically all of that. Allam al-Bayan. Now that you recognize certain tools, you've got the tool to identify right and wrong, which is a Quran. Ar-Rahman, Alam al-Quran, Khalaq al-Insan. You were created, but then you were given a very important tool, which is speech. Alam al-Bayan, Ash-Shamsu al-Qamaru bi-Husban. Everything is basically going to a certain structure. A structure. The structure, sun and the moon, the rotation that they would actually be in is basically telling you that everything from the skies, from the way that space is basically in, in motion, it's all in a structure. Everything in a, is in a structure, from the skies to the trees, to the, tr the, the plants that basically grow um, vertically or those that would basically uh, horizontally, each, each one, the shajar is basically horizontal, the vertical plants are basically the, the in, in najm, and not the stars, and Najm are basically the plants that grow uh, on, on the ground. Uh, and the Lord Almighty had built up and had risen the skies and put in Al-Mizan, the scale, the structure, the stability. There's a certain level for each and every single thing where there is a structure to go off of the structure is to bring in chaos. So when you look at that piece of it, it's in order to bring it to our attention, to bring it to our attention that you would basically live the structure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had assigned in adab. So not at all is it that, yes, if you, will, if you were to put structure, that that's adding on to the stress. This doesn't add on to the stress. This actually takes away the stress. Why? Because once we put in adab, once we put in principle, it will help the community live in one, knowing their limit, two, recognizing the structure, three, recognizing their principles and justice. And of course, what adab is, adab is an internal beauty. It's adopting the internal beauty of the structure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had defined what principle looks like. As we recognize that there's an external beauty, the internal beauty is even more important to take in consideration and even take it seriously. So anyhow, to go back to for al-adab in giving is taslim. It taslim basically means the greetings. 
So the, the adab is basically to start with a taslim, starting with a taslim, even before you even talk, because it makes no sense to start with a taslim and start talking and greeting one another in all the details and forgetting to start out with a taslim with basically saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah before, um, uh, before basically starting with Oh, sorry about that. So the Prophet ﷺ even said in the hadith, لا تأذنوا لمن لم يبدأ بالسلام. So whoever doesn't start with a salam, don't even start. In other words, they don't give them the permission. They would have to learn how to start with a salam. Ibn Umar basically said the Prophet ﷺ said, السلام قبل السؤال فمن بدأكم بالسؤال قبل السلام فلا تجيبوا. He said, Islam starts before even engaging in any, basically, in any, in any inquiry or even in any conversation. Whoever starts with the question, don't respond, basically, starts with the question before salam, don't even respond to them, not until it basically learn the adab. So you might say, well, it's rude not to answer. And basically, they ask me, how are you doing? And I'm just staying quiet. It's rude. So here the Prophet ﷺ said, basically, we need, that's a certain way of teaching people how to start with a taslim, how to start with peace, how to start a conversation, teaching your, your, your children that, hey, when you meet someone, stand up, put your hand out, reach, look at eye to eye contact. Put your hand, your right hand, make sure that your hands are clean all the time so that way people will not be disgusted of you. Start with a salam. And of course, the Prophet Salam was teaching them how to do that. So teach your children how to do that because teaching the children the structure of a taslim is basically teaching them the start of a conversation, how to start a conversation, how to meet people, how to stand in front of them, how to relate to them, how to do physical contact, or even let's call it eye to eye contact. Let's see, um, Ata, which is Ata ibn Abi Rabah, he basically said, I heard Abu Huraira say, إِذَا قَالَ الرَّجُلُ أَدْخُلْ وَلَمْ يُسَلَّمْ فَقُلْ لَا حَتَّى تَأْتِيَ بِالْمُفْتَاحِ or بِالْمِفْتَاحِ قُلْتُ أَسَّلْهَامْ قَالَ نَعَمْ <laughs> All right, so what happened? Abu Huraira, he basically, uh, a man came and then he said, should I come in? And he said, and of course, the man obviously did not say salam. And he said, no, not until you bring in the key. And he said, I, that is, I thought, he said, are you talking about the key to mean is salam? And he said, yes. Let's see this one, nine. Okay. And now what happened was, is that that was the key. It's like teaching them, you know, just like, well, what's the magic word? And here's the magic word is really a salam. That's al-muftah, of course, a magic word. The oh, magic yeah, word. instead of please. Exactly. <laughs> instead of please, it's like, what's the magic word instead of please? And here, the magic word to start a conversation, the magic word, or at least the key to starting a relationship is really assalamu alaikum before you even enter. What's the magic word? Assalamu alaikum when you first enter. Let's see. Another story, same thing. So Rabbi ibn Hirash, he basically uh, he said, حدثنا رجل بني عامر أنه سادنا عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو في بيت فقال ألج يعني أدخل فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لخادمه أخرج إلى هذا فعلمه الاستئذان فقل له قل السلام عليكم أدخل So what happened? رجل بني عامر, a man from بني عامر um, basically uh, requested or the permission to basically enter on the Prophet ﷺ while he was in this room. So he said, can I come in? And the Prophet ﷺ told his servant, in other words, the, basically the, uh, the man that was serving the Prophet ﷺ, he said, go out and teach that man the appropriate way of seeking permission. At least then, go out, go out and just teach him how to do it. فَقُلْ لَهُ and tell him. Now the Prophet ﷺ is demonstrating to him how to teach him. So he said, tell him, 
قل السلام عليكم. He said, and say, tell him, say السلام عليكم. Can I come in? The man heard him and he said, السلام عليكم. Can I come in? So the Prophet ﷺ said, وعليكم. He said, and peace and blessings be upon you. Come in. Look at that. So this is here the Prophet ﷺ. Then Abu Dawood, then I guess Ahmad and who's that supposed to be? Okay. Uh, Sheen. That's supposed to be okay. All right, um, let's continue. I don't know right now. It's not you, you could see I'm not completely focused today. All right, Zaid ibn Aslam basically said, Arsalani, uh, call Arsalani Abi ila ibn Umar. His dad sent him to Ibn Abdullah ibn Umar, and then he said, Can I come in? and basically recognized his voice that is Abdullah ibn Umar, and he said, Yes, son, if you were to come to any group of people. Start with saying "Assalamu alaikum." If they respond to you, then say, "Can I come in?" So here we go. Now he's trained, uh, training him, and you can see Arnaut. And Arnaut is a scholar originally from Albania, but many in Arnaut they lived in Syria, and many of them lived in Lebanon and lived in Palestine. Um, so they were basically at the time of the USSR, the former USSR, they were uh, basically facing a lot of persecution from them. Um, so basically they started fleeing to the Uthmani Khilafah and the Uthmani Khilafah um, at the time basically had given them a place to seek refuge in, in Syria, Vladishan basically. So we have a lot of Arnaut family even in Palestine. Um, okay. Uh, and of course, Al Arnaut, uh, since we talked about that, Al Arnaut is Shaib Al Arnaut. He was an important scholar. And maybe I could show you who recently died. Um, let's see, maybe I could show it to you. Uh, Shaib Al Arnaut, here we go. All right. And this is basically him. Okay. And a major scholar in Hadith. I think he wasn't really given the appreciation that he deserves. I did actually do a whole lecture. He also had, you could see that he really looks Albanian, doesn't he? Um, so Shaib uh, al-Arnaut, he had a, a team of women that were scholars in Hadith that were working with him. So this was his library and all these different people would basically um, support um, the effort that he was doing for the Ilm al-Hadith. Right, so I think he really deserves that appreciation. Okay, anyhow. Um, all right, let's continue. So um, how do we actually do, how many times do we do salam? So basically repeat it three times. And then if you said salam alaikum three times and they didn't allow you to enter, then go back and don't continue coming in. They just don't want you in, simple. Um, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri basically was um, basically the youngest Sahaba. And he said, كنت في مجلس من مجالس الأنصار إذ جاء أبو موسى كأنه مذعور. So he said we were sitting at a setting and the Ansar. The Ansar were basically the Sahaba from the residents of Medina. Abu موسى came in and he seemed afraid, startled, scared, and he basically came, uh, basically said, استأذنت على عمر ثلاثا فلم يؤذن لي فرجعت. فقال ما منعك قلت استأذنت ثلاثا فلم يؤذن لي فرجعت وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا استأذن أحد أحدكم ثلاثا فلم يؤذن له فليرجع فقال والله لا تقيمن علي عليه ببينة أي إن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال هذا الكلام أمنكم أحد سمعه من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال أبي ابن كعب والله لا يقوم معك إلا أصغر القوم قال أبو سعيد فكنت أصغر القوم فقمت معه فأخبرت عمر رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ذلك so that this is a scary story so Abu Sa'id al-Khudri was sitting down and what happened Abu Musa Abu Musa al-Ash'ari basically he came in so scared and he said, I came and knocked at Umar ibn al-Khattab three times and he did, not, he did not give me the permission to come in. So I went back and he said, well, Umar, that is Umar ibn al-Khattab. He said, what made you go back? 
And he said, I basically had seek permission three times and you didn't allow me to come in. And I heard the Prophet say, if any of you were to seek permission three times and you're not given the permission, then go back. And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, if you don't bring evidence to prove what you had said. In other words, if you don't, you got to prove. Wallah, you got to prove that. In other words, that's a big deal. So in other words, prove that the Prophet had said that. And then he came to the Prophet and said, did any of you hear the Prophet say that? Ubay ibn Ka'b said, you know what? The youngest of us is going to go and actually bring that evidence. In other words, as a witness. So Abu Sa'id, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he said, I was the youngest within that group. So I got up and went with him. And I went to Umar al Khattab and said, yes, the Prophet did actually say that. And of course, uh, this is this is important. And, uh, and of course, that's the same thing, whether you're basically, um, uh, you know, answering a phone call, say, salamu alaikum. That's the first thing that you would want to say. And of course, um, scholars, I think it's important to mention that scholars had differences of opinions in regards to bringing taslim. I want you to focus on that one. It taslim ala nisa. What does it mean? To bring about the greetings on women, it let's let's start with this one. Asma uh, uh, bint Yazid ibn Sakan. She basically said the Prophet had passed by us, and we were a number of women, and he said, Assalamu alaikum. Let's see. So this hadith you could see it's in a number of different uh Ibn Majah, Ibn Dawood. Uh, what is that? Okay, I, you know, it's, it's really weird how they actually did their referencing here. Okay, so basically, um, the Prophet ﷺ had himself done it, so you could see who else did this, and even Sahiha, so basically Al-Bani, a hadith number this. Okay, let's see another hadith. Jarir radiallahu uh, anhu. Jarir ibn Abdullah was considered, uh, Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajli, uh, considered one of the tallest Sahaba. I guess, it, you know, the, the height really is always there present. He was actually, the Prophet ﷺ, listen to this, listen to this. Ya Allah, I love this hadith. So Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajli, the Prophet ﷺ, he said the Prophet ﷺ was in a setting. Okay, listen to this. And Jarir comes in and he notices that everyone was staring at Jarir. Jarir the Prophet was giving like a khutbah. So Jarir was really concerned. And he said to the man next to him, was there anything that I had done that the that it's making everybody stare at me? And the man responded, well, the Prophet just said that a man alayhi mishatu malak or mishatu, that he has the appearance of an angel is going to come in right now and you're the one that came in. So everybody was looking at you because you have an angel's appearance. And of course he was extremely delighted. Imagine someone telling you that, uh, it was the Prophet Sallam, not someone, but imagine the Prophet Sallam telling you that you look like an angel. Wow. <laughs> you look like an angel, imagine that. All right. And of course, um, let's say, Jarir said, Marra Rasulullah that the Prophet passed by a group of women and he basically salam alayhim, not to mean salam in where uh, in where he was actually shaking their hands, but salam alayhim just said salamu alaykum. Al Hassan al Basri, who's Al Hassan al Basri? Al Hassan al Basri was basically a tabiri. And the one to raise Al Hassan al Basri to be his nanny was Umm Salama, who's Umm Salama, the Prophet of Salam's wife. The Prophet of Salam's wife, she was basically his nanny. And he basically said, So the women would many times would actually say, Salamu alaikum when they're passing by men. And of course, and the women would also say the same thing. But here's a the question there are there are certain things that I think is worthy of mention here. 
if we're talking about young women, teenage women, 20s, early 20s, et cetera, that's considered young or even 30s considered young. So in that situation, if we're talking about, let's say, men, probably equivalent to their age, um, to say salamu alaikum to them. And it's really common that women would personalize things and she would think, oh, I think he has a crush on me or all this kind of language. So it is not the sunnah to say it-taslim on young women. So men should not say salamu alaikum for younger women just to prevent fitna, just to prevent fitna. But it's okay to say taslim on older women. How much is older? How much is older is basically determined based on one of the, I guess, whoever is, you know, if we're talking about a 20 year old, probably saying it taslim on a 40 year old woman, it's completely different than probably a, a 40 year old man saying taslim on probably a, 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 maybe a 20 year old woman. All right, so you could you could see that. I think it, this is important to mention, and all of that is really based on the basis of an illegal maxim. It's called sadidhara. What is sadidhara? Sadidhara is a very important legal maxim, which basically means to close the doors and block all the means to whatever leads to a fitna. Whatever leads to a fitna. Basically, you're blocking the means. What's a fitna? Basically, trials, basically the change in people's discipline, in, um, in their expectations, all of that. So basically, to keep that in mind. Let's see. So we're, we're going to go in details in just a bit about that. But I think it's important to mention that. That way, I won't forget it. As for taslim, salam ala subyan, basically the young children. Let's see. Thabit al-Bunani. Rahimahullah, he said, I was sitting with Anas ibn Malik and he passed by young children. He said, Assalamu alaikum. So basically, teach the children by you yourself giving them to sleep. By you, and I, I must admit, there's one thing that I noticed here. Um, I, I, you know, we have a large group of uh, Saudi kids and Arab kids, and I, must admit there's one thing that I noticed about the Saudi kids um, that I didn't notice in other kids, to be honest. And I think it's worthy of mention um, that even though they're young kids, maybe seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, but I think they do an outstanding job in it, Taslim. Um, even when we would go up in the elevator, they would leave the elevator. Let's say they're in the elevator. They would say, Salamu alaikum before leaving. Um, same thing when I was talking the other day with a, a 10 year old boy and he was telling the other boy, um, Abu Khalid, even though he was just a young boy, he was just a 10 year old boy, but he was ca calling Abu Khalid. So they nicknamed themselves like their adults treated themselves like adults. So, yes, yeah, not always, you know, <laughs> behaving like adults, but, um, you know, I think. Yeah, they were the other day even ring the doorbells at everyone, but not always. They're still children. They're still children, but I think it's worthy of mentioning at least some of the good traits, some of the good behaviors. I think um, it's worthy of mention. Um, and I think I wish that other kids would actually learn at least the good, okay? At least the good discipline, all right? Um, and of course, in order to teach the children how to do that taslim, is basically you yourself. Whenever you see children, say salamu alaikum to them. Let them feel like they're grown adults and not always be treated like children. And as Ibn Malik said, I was with the Prophet and he passed by the children and he said, assalamu alaikum ya subyan. Basically said, assalamu alaikum children. Right there, let's see this hadith. Oh, it's in Al-Bukhari. You, you can't beat that one. It's in Sayyid Muslim as well. So let's see. Al-Arna'ut in regards, I guess, in Tirmidhi. And here, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, I'm assuming that's the abbreviation for it. He said, Isnadu Hassan. So what about if we're passing by a group of Muslims? How do we actually do that? Zayd ibn Aslam, he said that the Prophet, Sallam, he had a quote, said that the person that is basically riding, so we're talking about a person that's riding, would basically spread the taslim, basically spread the greetings on the person that's walking. And if there's only, so let's say there's a group 
and one is passing by and you say salamu alaikum does every single person within that group have to say tasleem so one is enough to respond not everybody in the crowd um, needs to basically say in one voice wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah it's enough one is it one is enough to respond and that's why the Prophet ﷺ in Hadith Fadal ibn Ubaid that the Prophet ﷺ said, "Yusallim al-rakib ala al-mashi, wal-mashi ala al-qaad, wal-qalil ala al-kathir, wal-sahir ala al-kabir, wal-mashi yani ayyuhu ayyuhuma bada afa huwa afdal." He said, "The person that is basically riding would pass on the taslim on the person that's walking." Is that and the same for a car? This uh, well, I mean, it depends on how fast you're going. So al-mashi. Meaning the person that is walking on the person that's riding. So in that situation, and the few on the many, and even the young on the older, of course, and and the two that are walking, whoever starts would basically be better. Um, and in that situation, can we actually say in the car, it depends on how fast, if you're driving 60 miles per hour and you're giving this lean girl, I'm not sure if your voice is even going to be heard. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right. But if you're driving at 10 miles per hour or who knows if you're basically trying to get anywhere and you've got your windows rolled down. So, hey, um, let's do Tesleem. It would be nice. All right. Um, so it depends on the circumstances, because if you're talking about speed, yes. All right. Um, let's see. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he basically said, إِذَا مَرَّ رِجَالٌ بِقَوْمٍ فَسَلَّمَ رَجُلٌ مِنَ الَّذِينَ مَرُّوا عَلَى الْجَالِسِينَ وَرَدَّ مِنْ هَاُولَاءِ وَاحَدْ أَجْزَأَ عَنْ هَاُولَاءِ وَعَنْ هَاُولَاءِ Basically said, quote, the Prophet Sallallahu had said, if um, men were to pass by a group of people, and then they basically, one had said, um, in the group of people that are sitting down, one had basically said, Assalamu alaikum. And of course, one only responded, he said that, that should suffice to basically respond on both on behalf of all. So even if we're talking about one, let's say, in other words, it would suffice on behalf of the group if one were to actually do a taslim. Okay, so let's just, um, and what about if they were not Muslim? Let's say, Anusama bin Zaid basically said the Prophet passed by in a setting where he, and in that setting, you had a group of Muslims and even Jews sitting together. And the Prophet said, Assalamu alaykum. Uh, uh, alayhim. Basically said, Assalamu alaykum. So it was a group of Muslims and non Muslims together, but he basically said, Assalamu alaykum. And of course, how do we actually do that? Musa and Harun were ordered to go to the Fir'aun and basically says, let's see. And he said, فَأْتِيَهُ فَقُولَا إِنَّ رَسُولَ رَبِّكَ فَأَرْسَلْ مَعْنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِلَ وَلَا تُعَذِّبُهُمْ قَدْ جِئْنَاكَ بِآيَةً مِنْ رَبِّكَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الْهُدَى How did Prophet Musa and Harun alayhi salam um, basically uh, let's say apply the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and come to him, that is Musa and Harun, and tell and say, We are the messengers of your Lord Almighty. So give us the Bani Israel, the children of Israel, and do not torture them. We had come with signs and miracles from your Lord Almighty, and peace be upon those that had followed the guidance. So therefore, to basically greet the non-Muslims, you're saying, Assalamu alaikum, peace on those that would basically follow guidance. So Assalamu alaikum, you don't say that to a Muslim, you say that to a non-Muslim. Let's see, Al-Qama, إنما سلم عبد الله رضي الله عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه على الدهاقين إشارة الدهاقين هي سجمع دهقان وهو رئيس القرية. So basically عبد الله بن مسعود had basically passed by uh, basically you know uh, those that it's, it's it seems like they were not even Muslim but uh, basically by a group of people who kind of it's kind of like a mm, Seems like they were having a meeting or something, but anyhow, uh, they basically are the owners of uh, the chieftains and basically like a realtors. And uh, the Abdullah Masoud just gave like a hand gesture in order to substitute for a taslim. Let's see, what about if they are basically sinners? Okay, 
do we say that as well? Do we give the same as well? I would say, although here, uh, basically, you know, you could see in where the Khutbah al-Hajjaj, you could see Jabir ibn Abdullah said, I went uh, into the Hajjaj and I didn't even say, Salamu alaykum, um, or even um, Sharab al-Khamar, Zalim, Zani, etc. All those that would engage in major sins, that they would or those that would announce their, their major sins. Um, that Al-Hasan had said, Laysa baynaka wa bayna al-fasiq al-hurma. That there is no, the word hurma to mean that there is no, uh, the word hurma, how can I translate that one? So it's kind of like a, an honor, okay? That there is no honor to al-fasiq, so don't say, uh, don't say salamu alaikum. Is that necessarily accurate during our times today? So not necessarily accurate. It depends on the circumstance. So looking at the circumstance is really important. If you feel that by greeting them, that you're probably reminding them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then definitely do that. Then definitely do that. But if you feel that by greeting them, that they're going to somehow trespass their boundaries with you and probably bring you in and 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 bring in that temptation and all of that, then don't say taslim on those that behave and, and basically engage in major sin. So in other words, there are certain people that it's okay for you to get out of your, to get them out of your circle. Even if your circle of greeting, yes, if you know that person, is just a person of sin. Don't even say salam alaikum. Don't even, don't even, don't even approach them unless you wanted to do that with them. That's a different story. But certain people, they don't even belong in your circle, not even for to sleep. So that's what that's what this is basically saying. But other, if the intention was to bring them closer to Hidayah, then start with the taslim in order to bring them closer to Hidayah. Because remember, in order to change people's uh, to change people's behaviors, they really need to find peace in your words. They need to find that you're close to them. So in other words, they really need to feel that connection. All right. So at the end of the day is that it depends on your expectations and the circumstances that surround that surround that taslim right there. And of course, the impact it will have on their heart and even on your heart as well. Let's see. The worst of, of course, the abkhal uh, nasi man bakhila biradi salam. When we say bukhal, we're talking about stingy, but of course, this is not talking about stinginess in terms of money. But this is actually talking about the people that lack mannerism are basically the ones that do not bring in the greeting. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا حُيِّيْتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّهَا If you were to be greeted, then bring about a greeting either better than it or something similar to it. That's why the Prophet actually said in the hadith, quote, أَعْجَزُ النَّاسِ مَنْ عَجَزَ عَنِ الدُّعَى وَأَبْخَلُ النَّاسِ مَنْ بَخِلَ بِالسَّلَامِ The Prophet said, the most ones to be the most disabled are basically those that are disabled from making the dua. And the most ones to be stingy are the ones to, that are stingy to not at least make and pass on a salam. So this is... Um, this is important, you know, even if you don't, and you're not capable of giving money, at least give salam, at least give peace, at least share it, give a kind word for God's sake. Of course, let's see. Um, we're going to pass really quick right here because of time. Um, let's see here. The Prophet Sallam, let's see this hadith. إِذَا انْتَهَا أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَى مَجْلِسْ فَلْيُسَلِّمْ فَإِنْ بَدَى لَهُ أَنْ يَجْلِسَ فَلْيَجْلِسُ مَا ثُمَّ إِذَا أَرَادَ أَنْ يَقُومَ فَلْيُسَلِّمْ فَلَيْسَتِ الْأُولَى بِأَحَقَّ مِنَ الْأَخْرَى So do we start with a tislim or do we end with a tislim? It's basically both. He said if basically you would end a certain setting, in other words, you had to leave, then say salamu alaykum. And if you would like to sit with the group, then sit. And if you needed to leave, then also say salamu alaykum because the first is no more or less important than the later. So when you come in, start with salamu alaykum. When you're about to leave, basically, giving your goodbyes, say salamu alaykum. Okay, let's see. Um, and of course, Abdullah ibn Husn uh, al-Darami, 
um, he basically was, he says here, وكانت له صحبة من his Sahabi, كان الرجلان من أصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا تلاقيا لم يفترقا حتى يقرأ أحدهما على الآخر والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر ثم يسلم أحدهما على الآخر said when the two men are of the, from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever they would meet, they would not depart one another until they would read and of course the ayat, and then they would say salamu alaykum to one another. Let's see. Um, you could see that uh, Albani regarded it as sahiha. All right. Um, and of course, uh, I'm just going to really make it here. I'm trying to will end it. Does it mention like do, so that was whenever they they met? Whenever, like any time. So that was basically the the sunnah, uh, or at least their practice. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean whenever you would basically practice it. That would be uh, that you had done exactly what the Prophet had done, what at least the Sahaba had done. So continue doing Okay, that. they were just reminding each other. Exactly. Know, it, was, it was just reminding each other. Um, okay, so we'll end right here, inshallah. Let, let's see this one. What about the, the, the non-Muslims? Let's see this one. مَرَّ عُقْبَ بْنُ عَامِرِ الْجُهَنَيْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ بِرَجُلٍ هَيْئَتُهُ هَيْئَتُ رَجُلٍ مُسْلِمٍ فَسَلَّمَ فَرَدَّ عَلَيْهِ عُقْبَ وَعَلَيْكَ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُ so Akbar ibn Amr al Juhani, he basically came across a man that had the appearance, or it seemed like he was dressed like a Muslim, and he basically said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So the young boy basically said, Do you know who you were actually talking to? In other words, who you responded to? So he said, um, Isn't he a Muslim? And he said, No, he's actually Christian. So Uqba ibn Amr went to him until he reached him and he said, Inna rahmatullahi wa barakatuh ala al mu'mineen. The mercy and the blessings is basically to be upon the believers. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you a long life and give you lots of wealth. Hmm? So basically made a dua for him for his dunya and not for the akhirah. Because for the akhirah, the person dies as a Christian, well, he can't have the mercy and the blessings of the mercy um, in, in the akhirah. But you can make the dua for a person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you a cure. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you a long life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you lots of wealth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you a millionaire. Whatever it is, you can make the dua for their dunya. Okay? Um, so basically, I'll, I'll just leave it at this. Inshallah, you know, there's, there's a lot to say. But I'll just leave it right here, inshallah. And we'll see you all tomorrow. If there are any questions, and of course, this is was just good commenting on this piece of it. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer it, inshallah. Um, sorry. So I, um, you know the hadith that we mentioned about the stingy and didn't say the salam? Mm -hmm. uh, so, because I know that when when we hear the name of the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi wa isn't that uh, in that situation too? Oh yeah, there are many situations. This isn't exclusive to one particular thing. So okay, yeah, okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. May Allah subhanahu wa taala make us from those that Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا قَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ طُبْتُمْ فَتَخْلُوهَا خَالِدِينَ May Allah subhanahu wa taala make us amongst those that Allah subhanahu wa taala would drive. They would be driven to the jannah in groups. When they would come to it, the doors of the Jannah would open. And the guards of Jannah would say, Salamun alaykum. Now that you would bring in an enjoyment in Jannah, so enter in it eternally. And same thing. Those that the Malaika would bring to death. Being when they are actually pure, when they're good, they would be told, Peace be upon you. Enter Jannah for what you had done. And in Ashab al Jannah, till Yawma fi shul and fakihun. Today, the people, the dwellers of Jannah, are basically busy in what? 
in just entertainment, them and their spouses would be in long shadows resting on sofas um, and inclining on them. They would basically have fruits and whatever they would want and seek salamun qawlan min rabbin rahim. Peace is basically the words that they will be told um, a word from the Lord, most merciful, almighty. May Allah subhanallah, that's an amazing yeah. way to end this. <laughs> it's <laughs> just Allah. you, Allah subhanallah, <laughs> make us from those, ya Rabbi. Ameen, ya Rabbi. Amen. We'll see you all tomorrow, inshallah. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.